Okay, so for today's lecture, we're going to pick up exactly where we left off last lecture. So just as a, um, just to kind of do an overview of what we did last time, we started on chapter three, where we are really examining how our programs actually execute, how they're actually uh, uh, execute within our system. And so the last place we left off was in 3.5. 4.3, so this subsection on how is data movement, how do we move data within our application? And so we're about to motivate, we're about to move into an example and motivate this example. So in fact, the entire point of going at the level that we're at here, So just, just to highlight the reason why we're going at such a low level and kind of re-emphasizing what has covered inside of your uh, inside of your assembly class is because we want to see how our underlying assembly tethers to our higher level languages. So again, the idea here is we understand how the data movement instructions like such such as the move and the uh, the return or ret are used in real world code. In particular, we want to see how our function parameters and the high-level languages uh, and our local variables can interact with our registers and our memory in our assembly code so that you kind of understand the one-to-one -one correspondence that's happening as your code gets translated into assembly instructions. Okay, so let's take a look at this function in C called exchange, just an example. So here we have our C code. We can see it has a return type. It has the identifier, the label, the name exchange, takes in two parameters, a pointer to a long, and then a long. We can then see inside of here that we're gonna dereference the pointer and save the value into a local variable. Then we're going to take the value that got passed in as a parameter, y, and save that at the that, that value in the memory location of where this pointer is at. And then we will return back our value x, which is the local variable here that we declared. Okay. So we can see what we've effectively done here is we're gonna take a pointer XP and a value Y and it's gonna swap the value point it by XP with Y and then return the original value. Okay, so let's take a look at the assembly code representation of our C code then. So again, we're effectively going to have this. So examining this right here, which is the, uh, the uh, definition of our um, or of our uh, function, and we're going to say then that XP, that first parameter, is going to be inside of our register RDI, and that our Y parameter would be in our register RSI. So then we could see on our second line when this gets translated into our assembly code we're going to fetch the value pointed by our XP, our X pointer, and store it into RAX. And then on line three here, we're gonna store the value of Y, which is an RSI, into RDI, that register. And then we're gonna return the calling function which is going to go ahead and uh, to go ahead and return, and we could we could see here that this allows us to go ahead and perform. Let's see here, the swap using the register spaces that was defined inside of our C code. So just some key insights here is that pointers in C are just addresses in assembly. The local variables like X are often stored in registers for faster access. And our parameters are passed through registers such as RDI and RSI, right? So this is the correspondence that we have 
when translating from a high level language to a lower level language. Okay, let's move to 3.4.4. Now that we've talked a little bit about how we move our data inside of our application, which was like the, the, the tail end of last lecture, let's move to our stack data. And in particular, pushing and copying data into our stack data. So of course, the reason why we care about this, the objective is to understand how our push and pop instructions manipulate our program stack. And so some background is that the stack is crucial for our procedure calls. And of course our stack exhibits a last in first out discipline. And of course, I'm sure that you already kind of looked at the stack operations in assembly. So this should just be for the most part, a, uh, a review of what you did and I imagine last lecture or last time you took assembly. Okay, so I'm not gonna spend too much time defining what a stack is. I mean, the basic definition of a stack is it's a, uh, it's a data structure that exhibits the last in first out manner. Uh, when we push, we're adding data into the stack and when we pop, we remove data. And in this instance, we should note that the top of our stack is uh, where we're gonna add and remove our data from. So with that said, let's look at how the program stack in x86-64 is defined. So here you can see I have an illustration. And so we have our memory region, which is going to be the uh, program stack, which is stored in some specific memory regions is allocated to us. So it's gonna be represented this blue uh, color, very light blue color. <laughs> then we're gonna have our stack pointer, which is gonna hold the address of the top stack element. So if you look, our registers are um, represented right here in these tables above our memory regions. And so the register we care most about is gonna be the stack pointer. So that's gonna be, uh, be our RSP register. And then the growth direction is gonna be downward. So as we add things to the stack, it's gonna go down. And so our top element is gonna be at the lowest address then. Um, so to take a look at this and you can see, we have our addressable memory right here in our stack. Currently, and if, if we think about a temporal evolution as we read the stack from left to right, we can see how the top, the top of our stack shifts based off of the value held in RSP. So we could see at the initial state that we start in this illustration, our value, our memory address is 108, which represents right here, that's the top of our stack. And then we could see when something has been added to our stack, right? We have a new memory address, it's grown downward. So now we have a, uh, a element with a lower address. So we're going to go ahead and update the uh, RSP register to have that new address to say that's where the top of our stack is. And if that gets popped off, if that gets returned back, then we would update that stack back to where the next top would be as we remove that. Okay, talked about this. Okay, so let's talk about the operations, our assembly operations that allow us to modify our stack. So we can push data onto the stack using the push queue. And of course, queue is our quad words because we're operating in a 64-bit uh, environment. And then uh, an example of what we might push might be some value in some other register. Uh, like say, for instance, uh, uh, we can push from our RB, uh, BP uh, register here. So our equivalent code here would be as if we decrement the stack pointer, right? So we could go ahead and subtract a quad word by a immediate value of eight, a constant value of eight, which is gonna be the, um, the number of bytes that our quad word is. And then we would then pass to, uh, the thing we're subtracting from would be our stack pointer. And then we could then move. And then I have another slide on here. When you see inside of here, parentheses wrapped around your register space, 
that means it's something that's in memory, where it's a memory address and not a data value. So recall that our registers can either hold a value or a memory address to somewhere else in the system. And so we distinguish that inside of our assembly code on whether we have a reference, just the reference to our stack, or if we encapsulate the reference to our stack in parentheses. And so I think I have a slide in the, um, in the futures uh, set here that will go into more detail on that. And again, our pop would be very similar. We can just go ahead and do pop queue and then provide some register that we want to utilize. And of course, both pop and push affect our RSP, right? So instead of having to manually go ahead, we could manually do it. Again, we can alias. So the idea of pop and push can effectively be thought of as aliases as these equivalent code blocks, but it's much easier to perform these tasks than um, um, directly manipulating our RSP register. And this, this should be very similar to what you did in assembly as well, right? Okay, so besides accessing the topmost element in a stack, because that's what we're used to, that's the concept of what usually drives stacks, it's also possible for us to access arbitrary stack positions. So again, we can access these specific positions on the stack using our, our memory addressing methods, the same way that we've been able to index into other contiguous blocks of memory. So since we know that our stack grows downward, we can apply a positive offset from our RSP register, right? That's our stack pointer register to point to some stored data that's in there. So if I want to go ahead and do this, the syntax that I'd be interested in is going to be to, again, encapsulate whatever register I want in between parentheses, because now I want to treat that as a memory address. And if we want to access an arbitrary stack position, we want to actually get a memory address and not a value, not treat the address as a numerical value. And then we can apply some offset so that we can go ahead and move that many uh, bytes from that memory address. So the way that this would actually look is I could move Q, and of course, whenever you see Q, just think that's your quad word, you know, for a 64-bit env uh, environment. And so we're gonna uh, move Q, and then this would be our stack pointer, so the address of our stack pointer. And since we're wrapping that in parentheses, we're actually using that as a memory location. And then by applying the value of eight, we're actually producing an offset. So instead of getting the memory location of the RSP of our, of our stack pointer, we're going to advance it by eight bytes. And then I can then on that move, recall that that is a operation that has a source and a destination. So the first parameter here is my source. And the second parameter is going to be the destination from where I want to move the data from that arbitrary stack position into a register so that I can then go ahead and access it. And so effectively what this does is it would copy the second quad word from our stack into our register space, uh, in particular, the register of RDX. Okay, so just some key takeaways about pushing and popping. We talked about how to push, we talked about popping, we talked about what a stacks are, and we talked about how we can arbitrarily actually grab data inside of our stack at any point. So did you, just, just to confirm, did y'all pretty much cover these concepts inside of assembly as well? Excellent. Okay, well, we'll just move on. So the next thing that I just wanna make sure everyone's intimately familiar with is going to be how is the arithmetic and logical operations actually implemented and executed through assembly. So let's clearly just do a quick overview for 
uh, we want to introduce our various arithmetic and logical operations. We already did this when examining C. So now let's look at how we can do those same things inside of assembly so we can see that one-to-one -one correspondence. And as we step through this, we're going to do some classifications of the type of operation. Some of those are going to be to load an effective address, which is going to be very important for how we generate pointers in C. Uh, then we're going to look at our unary and binary operations, and then we'll look at our shift operations. Now, again, we already saw how to do those in C. We'll just quickly see how to do it in assembly too. Kind of want to have all this foundational stuff. It's going to be important for when we actually start using a debugger and we want to look at disassemble code, right? To be able to retranslate what was compiled so that we can reinterpret that back into our C code. And to give you a further motivation of why we want to go through chapter three. Okay, so uh, operand sizes, again, whenever we see the ladder to letter applied to a lot of these operations, it has to do with indicating to you what is the word size that this particular uh, operator is going to be working on. So it's our, effectively how we handle data types at the assembly level. So again, B is byte, uh, W is word, uh, double word is uh, L, and quad word is Q. And that's going to be like one byte, two bytes, four bytes, and eight bytes. Okay. So now let's talk about, so out of these in particular, yeah, we already had done a breakdown. It doesn't give me my listing here. So we'll look at load effective address first and we'll look at a collection of these operations and we'll look at shift operations. And then we might talk a little bit about the special arithmetic operators. Uh, I'll probably mention them as it relates to multiplication and division because those can produce really big numbers and we should see how does our system, how does our assembly ha uh, um, language handle the multiplication of big numbers. We'll take a look at that as well. So looking at the load effective address, LEA is going to be, um, our keyword that we would actually use for that, or we can use LEAQ to imply a quad word. Remember, if we go ahead and run our code through a disassembler, sometimes it might emit that Q. And again, this, this is all gonna be very relevant when we do our bomb lab. Okay, so our objective for learning about our LEA um, operator is, is primarily used for computing effective addresses without actually dereferencing them. Hence a pointer. So it's you, uh, but but what we're going to see is besides uh, generating pointers for us, we can use it in a very clever way to do arithmetic mathematics as well. And we're going to see how we can exploit this to optimize some computations for some arithmetic computations for us. Uh, let's see here. So we could pretty much think of uh, LEA or as a uh, as equivalent to a move operation with the key difference that the move will actually move the contents of a source address to a destination while LEA moves the address itself. So again, the idea here is starting to think we can not only just move data around, because that's what we saw last time, right? That's what we looked at at the very end of last lecture. How do we move data around in our application at a very low level? Now we're gonna look, how do we move the addresses of where memory resides at. Because those are the two, these are the two ways we can pass data around, whether we're thinking of Java or whether we're thinking assembly, is you're passing by reference or you're passing by value. Okay, so the one unique behavior that we're gonna look at this one in particular that you should keep be aware of with load effective address is gonna be that it's it's not referencing the memory or the, or the values of the memory, it's just referencing the memory address. So let's take a, and look at the basic operation of this. Uh, we can say that we can split this into the format of our call, the first operand and the operation. So our example would look like this here at the bottom where we can call LEA and in particular, if I wanna ensure that it works in our 64-bit environment, we can append the Q to that. 
And notice what I have here is I'm passing in effectively two different types of, there's two parameters per se. The first is gonna be nested inside these uh, parentheses where I'm gonna pass in my base address, my index address, and some multiplier value. So this first operand looks like a memory reference, but doesn't read from that location. That's the big thing to know. It's not dereferencing, uh, it's not dereferencing that uh, the value at that memory location. And this is effectively here, the addressing mode of what we're looking at there. So in the example that we see here, RDX is both our base and our index register. And then our scaling factor is gonna be the size that each addressable unit is, is based off of what we know. So if we, if we expect this to be a uh, double word, we would wanna advance by four bytes or have a scaling value of four bytes. So if I go to compute, the result of this, it'd be the equivalent of five times RDX. And then we would store this inside of our RAX register. The way we get this five times the this register at RDX is we would take, uh, let's see, do I have my, this is our computation here. So we take our base and we add it by our index that we want to advance by times the size, times the scale. Now, obviously we can use this to be able to generate a pointer because now what we get back is not the dereference value, but a memory location of where that's at. So we can hand that off and now have access to that location in memory. And so this is just an example in code how we can do that. Recall that we can always put this immediate value in front as an offset to say, okay, starting at this memory location at our register RDI, advance that by 16 bytes and then grab that memory location and save into RAX. Okay, now I said, it's obvious that you can use this load effective address to generate pointers. But I also said, and again, one of the motivating factors about exploring the system level programming concepts is based off of how do our systems optimize for performance sensibilities. And so LEA can also be used for arithmetic operations. So we can, what we're gonna do here in this like subsection is we're gonna understand how LEA can perform our arithmetic operations without actually dereferencing our memory. And so a quick example, suppose that we had RDX that's holding some numerical value that we will call X. Then we can do the instruction where we can exploit the fact of using the offset and then the memory location where we then produce this computation that we saw before to go ahead and create the offset memory address. And this computation will end up resulting in a arithmetic formula that looks very much like five X plus seven. And, if, and then we would actually store that result into RAX. And again, the same way that we're effectively utilizing this, uh, the, this uh, uh, instruction to produce an offset in an address, we can use it to do a complex arithmetic operation very simply with one instruction. And so that's just, a simple example of a clever use of how you can start to use these 
instructions at the assembly level to start doing complex things in a higher level format. Once you understand what computations are being uh, exploited. Now, you should understand that there are some operand requirements in order for you to use LEA effectively. And so it has to be a register. You, you probably noticed it was always a register that it was operating on. So we've seen in the past where other operators could use a combination of immediate values, memory values, and register values. In this instance, it's just register values. Okay, so big takeaway at least is that it's a versa it's a uh, it's a pretty versatile instruction that we can use beyond just loading addresses. We can generate pointers and we can also use it to go ahead and perform arithmetic operations. Okay, let's move on to the unary and binary operations. These are the more common ones that you're probably familiar with and you played around with a lot in assembly. So again, when we talk about a unary operation, it means it only has one operand. When we talk about a binary operation, it means it has two operands, right? So examples of a unary operand where it only has a single operand might be, for instance, an increment or decrement operation inside of C or inside of Java, right? Where you can apply a modifier to a value and it either increments its value by one or decrements it by one. And in fact, we have those implementations right into assembly. So this would be the equivalent of our plus, plus, or minus, minus inside of C. Now, notice what's nice is we can do this not only by passing the value in. So if I, if I, if I had omitted, let's look at this. If I had omitted the parentheses, I would be treating this as a value that's at some register space. In this instance, I'm operating on the stack pointer register. And so I don't want to actually treat the stack pointer as if it's holding data. I want to treat the stack pointer as if it's holding a memory address. So if I want to use my increment or decrement operation on those, I'm going to wrap it inside of parentheses to say, oh, this is a pointer to, this is a memory address that's being pointed somewhere. And then I'm incrementing the memory address up or down to be able to advance my pointer. Probably useless in assembly, but is there a postfix and prefix version in, in typical assembly? I don't. So I don't think so because with assembly, you're only executing one instruction at a yeah, time. So they don't have the notion of building those complex expressions and statements like you can do in the higher level languages. Which are usually just yep. using anything. Yep. But that brings up a good point because what's happening in the higher level languages when you have a post increment or pre increment is it's going to determine the order in which it disassembles into it, 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 it breaks it down into the assembly. Yeah, so you think of it as one operation, and it's two or three yep. operations just for that one. Yep. And so that's the nice thing about starting to build these connections is you can kind of see what has to happen to get everything to work in the order that you expect it to. Okay, let's move on to our uh, binary operations. And again, our basic idea here is that we will now have a source and a destination for I brought binary operations, whereas with the unary operation, our uh, we our source and our destination are one and the same. So here, our operand types will now uh, you typically allow us to have immediate values and registers and memories as our as our source, and then as our destination, we can either be a register or a memory location. We can never have a source be an immediate location because that's the equivalent of a constant value. Right, you can't overwrite what a constant means. So just some quick examples, and we're going to compare this to our uh, high-level C code. We might have sub Q and add Q. And again, I'm just highlighting the Q for our quad words to ensure that this works in our 64-bit environment. And so this, if I, this would be my source, 
this would be my destination. So this would be the equivalent to saying, I'm gonna subtract REX from RDX and store the result in RDX, right? So these are, so it's the equivalent of stating a compound assignment where take whatever our value of X is and subtract from it the value that's at Y. So we both produce a arithmetic operation and do an overwrite on one of those uh, operands. And so it's the same, if I do the add, it's the same, but instead of subtracting, we're adding. Okay, so one thing that you should be aware of, and this, this, this should be obvious, right? Like you need to be very mindful of how you're ordering your operands, right? So if in that other instance, you had your source and your destination, don't confuse those if you're either reading or if you're authoring uh, assembly. So this, so these, these, op these operators are, are, are effectively non-commutative. And it's always your source is the first uh, parameter and your destination is the second. Okay, so some quick mentions on our restrictions on operand types. And I think this is where I go a little bit more in, in uh, detail about our registers, how our registers can store data values or they can store memory pointers. And so again, if we look at these below examples, we could see we can even nest them, or I'm sorry, we can mix and match them is what I meant to say. We can mix and match where, for instance, this source is the value that's held inside of a uh, register. And this is going to move that to be the address, uh, a, a pointer inside of this space. Or we could do it flip flop, right? So just pay attention whether there's parentheses or not around your register. So I think that's the main takeaway there. Okay, so with that said, let's talk about what you can and cannot do with our operand types, right? So you can't have double memory operands, right? One of them has to be a register. You're probably familiar with that in assembly, right? So that's, that's consistent. So an invalid example then, if we think about how registers can effectively hold references to memory locations, we couldn't do something like this. Because even though that looks like it might be valid, because there's two registers there, the fact that they're both nested in parentheses means they're not values, but they're memory pointers. So that's the same as doing a memory lookup. So that doesn't actually count as a register space then. So this would be a more valid way of doing that. At least one of them has to be an actual register that you're accessing it and not treating it towards trying to uh, access some location in memory. And then the second, that we need to just discuss about, and we have already stated this, is that the second operand has to be some memory location or some register space. Okay, so just some key takeaways from those last couple of slides. We talked about unary and binary operations from, the, from our arithmetic and logical manipulate, uh, uh, manipulations. In fact, we're actually gonna look at a table that's gonna break them all down for us. Uh, we talked about the syntax and operand types, and we need to pay attention about our operand order. So, uh, okay, I think I have my table after the shift operations. Okay, so with our shift operations, we already looked at these at C, right, where we can shift our bits left and right. We have right shifts, left shifts, and we have in terms of our uh, shifts, also arithmetic shifts and logical shifts, when we're talking in particular about uh, uh, right shifts, right? Because the, you have different notions of numbers, whether they're 
unsigned or whether it's Sue's complement where you need to carry that sign bit. So all those same concepts that we covered in C, we already have operations to encode those directly into a symbol. So the translation of these is very simple. So if I want to shift my register uh, binary sequence left by two bits, I can call SHL, short for shift left. I And the first parameter is going to be the number of units I want it to be shifted by. And the second is the register I want it to shift. Also, there's a special register we can use. So instead of a immediate value here, like a constant value of a number, I can also pass in the CL register, which is the lower eight bits of the RCX register. So I can dynamically shift. So I can implement dynamic shifting in my logic if I wanted to. That is, now keep in mind, if you do that, it's gonna pull from the RCX. So you have to make sure that you're not mutating that. <laughs> or if you are mutating that, that nothing is valuable in there before you do that shift. Always be mindful of the opera, uh, what, what register these, these operations are looking at before you try to execute something. If there's ever anything of value, push it onto your stack and pop it back out after you're done, right? Otherwise bad things can happen, which is erroneous behavior. Okay, and so here, this is just an example of what that might look like using our uh, lower register space for dynamic shifting. And then we've already talked about logically the difference between an arithmetic versus a logical shift. But in order to actually express that in assembly inside of the assembly that we're gonna be looking at, we have, and again, these are for right shifts. We would have um, SHR, which is gonna be our logical shift right, just like we had SHL for a shift left, we have a shift right. And if we want an arithmetic shift, then we have SAR. And the AR is to illustrate that it's the arithmetic form of that. Now, when we look at the table, the notation that you're going to see on the table for all these operations, when I give you a kind of a cheat sheet on this, you'll see uh, I'm going to have um, the shift symbol, the same shift operator we use in C. It's either going to be appended with an A for arithmetic or an L for a logical shift. And here's just some examples of how our shifts would look. And again, it's not gonna to be too different. We're gonna have an immediate value as our first parameter. And then we're gonna have some register that contains some binary sequence that we wanna shift by that number of bits. And so the big thing about this though, is that with our left instruction, there's no conceptual difference between the arithmetic shift and the logical shift. So there is a SAL, right? A shift um, uh, and uh, a arithmetic shift to the left and a, uh, and a shift left, which is our logical sh shift. So just like we had our SAR, our arithmetic shift to the right and our shift right, our logical shift has different behaviors, these don't. So they're just the same way of doing the same thing or two different ways of doing the same thing. But for consistency's sake, it makes sense to have an arithmetic shift in the opposite direction. And then finally, one thing you should be able to know about shifting is the uh, destination, the, the destination of this oper operation can be a memory uh, address, right? It can be a pointer value. So it doesn't have to be, so I can nest that into parentheses. Okay, so just a quick takeaway. Our shift operations are pretty critical for manipulating data at the bit level. We already saw in the previous chapter how we take advantage of these in uh, left and right shifts to be able to actually perform arithmetic computations pretty efficiently. So you can see how it actually gets executed at the assembly level. And then our operand order types must be understood for effective programming, right? You have to understand what you can actually pass and what values are looking for your, uh, your source and your destination, and whether you wanna use a pointer or whether you wanna use a value. 
And obviously we already talked about the arithmetic and logical shifts prior, but now we can see how it actually gets implemented in assembly. Okay, let's move on to some discussion topics about the arithmetic and logical operations. Don't wanna to spend too much time for this. I just wanna focus on the fact that obviously you have to be considering whether you're using signed versus unsigned arithmetic uh, uh, numerical values and also the implications that we have for compiler optimization. So uh, typically two's complement is preferred and we've already stated this, almost always use two's complements versions of numerical values unless you have to use unsigned values. So we're gonna we're going to re-articulate that that's still the case because this is how it's being implemented. The generic instruction, the default instruction is using two's complements uh, notation of the binary uh, sequence. That's the context that's applied towards it. So the one exception though is gonna be obviously for right shifting, which is your arithmetic shifting because you're actually, you're actually defining a unsigned behavior to that. So clearly that's gonna be the one case you break that exception. And again, we already saw this in the last section. So we won't look at this in too much detail. And this is just some examples of how our C code we get translated into assembly. But again, it's just a, conceptually, we can kind of, well, I guess we can step through this very briefly. So let's look. So if given this code here, this high level code in my C code, it would then get translated into this assembly code. And so if I wanted to try to match where in my assembly code each of these instructions are being encoded, I can see, and you, we can follow along in the comments right here, but we can see on line two is where this operation here, the first operation X to the power of Y, I'm sorry, not to the power of the, uh, the XOR, starting to bleed languages across with operators. So my, I'm gonna do my XOR operation right here and then lines three through four where i want to take my z and multiply it by 48 which is a parameter so notice also our parameters are x y and z and so we're we know that there's a binding between our register spaces and our parameter space so we can state that our x value is going to be an rdi our y value is going to be in rsi and our Z value will be moved into RDX. So as we start to uh, operate on the values inside of our assembly, we know what's gonna be our X, Y, and Z terms based off of the registers. So for instance, on this instance where one takes Z and multiply by 48, we can see on lines three and four, how we can do this load and effective uh, address. And we're gonna do that computation. We're gonna take advantage of the fact that does that computation based off of the formula we saw on the prior slide. And then we can then go ahead and do an arithmetic shift to go ahead and get the final result. So this is an illustration of how we can start optimizing or how we don't, but how the compiler can optimize the arithmetics. And when you start looking at this, you. you when you look at the assembly, you would have to reverse engineer that logic, right? That's the idea. When you look at these instructions and you're like, why is this left shift happening? Or why is the load effective address happening here? Understanding why these, or that the compiler applies these optimization techniques will help you be able to reverse engineer to reparse the logic. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time just looking at this because that can really go into the weeds. Uh, but again, yeah, the big idea here is it's all about compiler optimization techniques, which is, again, one of the beautiful things that we love about high-level le languages, right? We don't have to know all the tricks 
of being able to force the compiler to do things as performant and as efficient as possible and how to load our data and utilize these operations and ways to produce results, we can rely on the compiler knowing those rules and applying them when they make sense. Okay. So I promised you the operator table and here it is. This is, oh Lord, it's small. Okay, let's see if we can't take and just, at least for now, zoom in on that sum. So we could say we have our load effective address. We have the ability to do effectively like an increment and a decrement and we can do a negation and a complement and addition, subtraction, multiplication. We can do XOR and OR and AND. And there's a, a lot of different options. What you're seeing here inside of here is what the whether we need a source and whether we need a destination. So is this a binary or is it a unary operation? And then it's implying whether the it's a destination or whether it's a source. That's what your S and D are. And then it shows you what the effect based off of your, your input, your, your source or whatever your initial state is and what the resulting state's gonna uh, provide you. And this though, I would imagine that everyone has already done something. There we go. You, you should have played with most of these inside of assembly and sometimes by me. But again, the important thing to understand is pretty much all of our logical and arithmetic operators that we have inside of C, inside of Java, inside of our high-level languages, we have an analogous form inside of our assembly. Okay, let's talk about some of the special arithmetic operations that we have. So beyond the basic arithmetic operations that we saw that operate on the data types that we are familiar with. So that is bytes, words, double words, and quad words. When we went through the mathematical concepts on multiplication, recall that the result in multiplication can very easily produce a much larger result based off of the original encoding. With addition, we stated it could, it would only ever be, it would only be able to increase in an order of one bit vector length greater than what we started with, right? So, so if we have like this concept of an overflow where you couldn't, you couldn't produce an encoded result of a summation between two bit vectors because it's too big, it would be too many bits to encode. The multiplication, it's much bigger than that, right? It's like double the size of our bit vector as opposed to our bit vector plus one in length. So we saw how we can just look at the modulus version, right? Last chapter, but in terms of the potential of actually producing reliable results, we can introduce the concept of an oct word, a 128-bit or 16-byte number that's used with a, the uh, multiplication uh, operations to be able to actually capture those values. So this is a special arithmetic operation. And so if I wanted to go ahead and examine this, these would be the uh, keywords I can go ahead and use to go ahead and uh, encode those multiplications inside of my assembly. So there's not much more to say except just to emphasize that in a 64-bit system, you don't really have 128 I'm sorry, in a 64-bit, yeah, in a 64-bit uh, system, you don't have a register that's actually 128 bits. So when you do go ahead and use these oct word um, operators, what ends up happening is your 
two registers that are used for your operand. So it requires obviously a binary operator. Both registers will be used to encode the result. And so in this instance that you see in the source code, suppose that I had um, my X value in RSI. And uh, so let's copy our X value into RAX because typically our uh, RAX register is where our multiplication operation is gonna look at for one of its values. And then we will then call our mol Q. And so mol Q on RDX can result in a 128-bit result where the lower bit encoding is going to be held in our RAX because that's our modulus, right? So that could be a 64-bit result. Or if we're using this special arithmetic operator, the other half of that binary sequence would then be also held in our RDX, uh, which is where our Y value is held at. And so both those would then get uh, overridden in that case. So it's possible. Okay, and just an illustration that we can actually have a C code that uses 128-bit encoding. This is an example of how we can do that and how it would then get uh, can translated into our assembly code example. And again, we can also do division and uh, modulus. And what we have here is our C code with that our division on long numbers. So that's gonna be a uh, modulus division. Or truncating <laughs> division. And then finally the modulus operator. And then we could see how that can then will then get translated into our assembly instructions here. So again, I'll make these uh, slides available for you if you want to step through and actually see the samples. And again, all this content should be following the contents of the book as well. Okay, so big takeaways from this area, the arithmetic operator, the special arithmetic operators is that there's a special oct word that kind of imaginarily exists because effectively you're just Frankensteining to 64-bit uh, registers together. And actually, this isn't a new concept. Uh, when you were learning MASM32, did you see how you can get a 64-bit result by Frankensteining to 32-bit registers together? Was that shown? This, it just illustrates we keep reusing these concepts. We're just increasing our... <laughs> The, like, the length of the bit sequences. I mean, the same thing happens with the eight bits. The, yeah. You, you had the HL and the, and the um, yeah, the lower and the yeah, higher. Yeah. I think to make a system yep. That makes sense. Well, if you have standard units, you can start combining them and applying additional logic to figure out how to create a bigger unit into smaller units. What's interesting, okay, so this is a sidebar. What's interesting is applying logic to try to get one addressable space in such a way that you can subdivide it into smaller addressable things. And that's how compression works. If you ever wondered, how can you take something and make it smaller? You can actually do some of this binary math and manually encode your bit sequences in a way that you're addressing into spaces that aren't actually addressable from the machine level itself. Like you're manipulating each individual bit and using it as effectively and efficiently as possible. Those conversion algorithms people have worked years on just tiny bits of- Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd- um, Back when I had taken uh, assembly many years ago, that's what one of the projects was, was to go ahead and design our own compression algorithm inside of assembly, doing just that. Try to configure a logic that exploits using all of our ability to use like our shift operators and our XOR operators 
and our AND operators so that we can directly control how our binary sequences were encoded at a per byte level to be able to compress a text file. And uh, if, if you haven't, that's a fun, so obviously not a homework I'm gonna assign in here and that's beyond the scope of, uh, scope of system programming concepts. But if you want like a fun endeavor to do, I would recommend like trying that just to challenge yourself at being able to like encode logic and an assembly level at that level. To, to that kind of degree. Okay, let's move on to the next section. So 3.5, I feel pretty confident of uh, on uh, what we're able to cover. So the next thing that I wanna do, cause I kind of wanna get through this. I think I'll, you are all kind of familiar with a lot of these concepts. We talked about now about the arithmetic operators, the logical operators and how they're implemented inside of, um, inside of assembly and we see they're not that dissimilar conceptually on how you can implement these expressions inside of a higher level languages. You just have to be more mindful about the order of your operations and the, your register versus your uh, memory locations. So now then the other thing that we have to be aware of when translating our application logic from a high level language into a lower level language is going to be, well, all of our uh, control structures, right? So it's one thing to be able to define our logical operators and our arithmetic operations, uh, right? And almost everything that we do inside of our software design, our software implementation is based off of those primitive operators. Well, we also need to be able to figure out a way, how are we gonna encode the logic of our ifs and our whiles and our for loops and our switch statements, you know, our, um, our selection, decisions and our repetition decisions. And so here we're gonna look at that, those concepts in 3.6. So the objective obviously then is to explore how our machine code can implement our conditional execution for things like conditionals, loops and switches, where the core concept would be say for instance, our jump instructions, that's going to be the basis of how we can go ahead and start creating these control mechanisms. We'll also look at data dependent control flows where it can be a, condi a conditional jump that we're doing. And then we'll also see how we can implement our C control constructs and compare them to how they would then be implemented in assembly. And again, our agenda for this section is we want to see how we can implement our conditional operations so that we understand that when our high level language gets compiled into our assembly code, what does it look like? How can I read it in a way that I can start thinking about assembly code as if it has the ability to map into C code? And of course this, we will have the subdivisions of this, we'll look at our, first of all, what are condition codes that we have available? And that won't just be control, condition codes are gonna be other concepts that are important to us and you're probably already familiar with. How do we access those condition codes? And then we're gonna jump, we're gonna talk about jump instructions and how we encode our jump instructions inside of our assembly. Then we'll see how we can use our jump instructions to be able to implement our conditional, our, our branching and also our looping. And then finally our switch statements. And so then by then we will learn of how we could do both all of our processing operators and all of our uh, control operations, which will give us a good handle on how we can start trying to use a debugger to, to parse through our compiled code and start seeing, trying to decipher what does it do. Okay, so quickly on our condition codes, we wanna understand how our condition code registers work and how they aid in our conditional branching. So the key terms we have here, but let me jump to the next slide so we can actually associate these with what they mean. So we have CF, which is gonna be our carry flag. We're gonna have ZF, which is gonna be our zero flag. We're gonna have SF, which is gonna be our sign flag. And we're gonna have OF, which is gonna be our overflow flag. 
right? So these are going to be the single bit registers that store attributes of the most recent arithmetic or logical operations. You're probably familiar with this in assembly, right? This is how you're able to determine when certain states occurred or certain uh, exceptional cases occurred or did not occur when you produce some kind of arithmetic operation or logical operation. And again, our conditions on when these codes are set are defined as such. So we have, uh, say for instance, on our carry flag here, it's simply if our unsigned T, okay, so given this, given this expression T, is equal to A plus B, well, if T ends up being smaller than A, then our carry flag is set. That makes sense. And that's on the instance of an unsigned overflow. Our zero flag is set if T is all zeros. Our signed flag is set if our value of T is less than zero. That means it's negative, right? And then our signed overflow is going to be based off of this uh, slightly more complex expression where it's, well, if A is less than zero, which is also equal to, so these are true false, right? So if it's true that A is less than zero and it's all, and, and uh, B is also uh, less than zero. So you check these conditions or they're both greater than, right? So it could be one or the other, but both these, would have to have the same result. They'd have to be equal based off of their truthiness. And if you had the condition where your end result of T is uh, less than zero, and it's not equal to when A is uh, less than zero. Exactly. So yeah, because you can have negative numbers, you're just having to check all the edge conditions to make sure that effectively you've had an overflow on your, because you have two different directions you can overflow with integers, right? You can overflow in a more negative uh, version and a more positive version. You'd be too big or like too, well, I guess too big, but too big negatively and too big positively. Okay, just some special cases about our condition codes. Our uh, load effective address does not alter any condition codes, right? Because it doesn't dereference anything, right? That's just operates on memory uh, addresses. So that does will not set any of your condition codes. Also, increment and decrement set the overflow and zero flags, but leave your carry flag unchanged. So just some special cases you should be aware of. Okay, so for setting condition codes without altering our registers, there's actually two instructions that we have. We have a compare, which can set your, again, allows you to set your condition code without updating or changing the state of any of your register spaces. And so here you can go ahead and uh, pass these values to a compare, and then it would then update your condition codes based off of the result of that. So for instance, your compare effectively does the expression where given a uh, source one and a source two, it would subtract, it would, it would give you the difference between source two to source one. And then it's going to go ahead and set the flags based off of that result. And you could do that with all your, you know, you have, uh, you could apply your data type size, your, your word size with the letters B for byte word double word or quad word. And your test instruction can set the condition codes based off of a bitwise and operation of two operands. So just so you, just things you can do to actually physical, uh, to manually affect your condition codes without having to do a computation. Okay, let's look at some examples very briefly. So we're gonna look at examples actually using the compare and the test. So in this instance, we, we could, use compare on our quad word and pass the two registers. It's gonna compare those two, or we can go ahead and do a test. And for our test, um, if REX is negative, zero or positive. So this is what it's gonna actually test for. Okay, so just some key takeaways about our condition codes. They're used for 
we're going to use these concepts, right? Our condition codes are used for our conditional branching, but it's used for you to learn other concepts too that base, it happens with arithmetic operations. We use instructions like compare and test just to test uh, to uh, set the conditions of the codes without us having to actually do any kind of arithmetic operations uh, in, in our register space. And then uh, understanding these codes is pretty critical so you know what happens with the state of your, um, uh, your spaces for your conditions, for being able to do your conditional operations. Okay, so let's move on to accessing the condition codes. So there's three common ways you can go ahead and use our condition codes we just defined. You can either set a single byte to be zero or one, because remember they're single byte registers. You can conditionally jump in our program so we can use keywords that based off of some criteria will jump into a particular space, into a particular uh, set of instructions inside of our assembly code, or we can conditionally transfer data, right? So instead of jumping to an instruction, we could conditionally go ahead and move data around. And we're gonna explore each one of those uh, right now. So in terms of being able to uh, set our instructions, we can alter a single byte to either zero or one based off of our condition code. We can have different suffixes that denote the different conditions. It's not our operands uh, sizes, right? So for example, and again, this is probably just parroting what you already knew from assembly. So up until now, whenever we had a suffix that we appended to the end of a operation, it was based off of whether it was a byte a word, a double word, or a quad word. In these instances with our condition codes, usually it's the type of condition we're looking for. So for instance, set L would mean set less versus set B, which would be set below. So you're starting to use it more as a relational set of words. Uh, and you're probably more familiar that with the jump conditions where you might jump if something's greater than or equal or jump if it's less than which we'll look at again, again, just we're covering the foundation. So I'm expecting that a lot of this you've seen before, we're just making sure that everyone is on the same page. So these are going to be the set instructions here. Again, we can see the different types of sets that we have. And so all these sets allow us to manually set each one of those conditional flag values that we have, which are those con uh, conditional codes that we have. So say for instance, set C would set our uh, zero flag or our not zero. So we could set C or set NZ, so not equal or equal. So set, so here we can do uh, greater, greater than equal, less, less or equal. Okay, so for instance, suppose I had this typical instruction where I wanna have this expression to evaluate A less than B. Then if I wanted to compare these, I would do a comparison. So here I would compare my source register to my destination register, my RSI and my RDI. Then I'm gonna set the lower byte order of my EAX register to either be zero or one. And so when I see EAX, since I'm also operating in a 64 bit, I could also express that as RAX, right? So the extended register name for that is gonna be RAX. Uh, so anyway, I'm gonna set the lower, uh, the, uh, lower byte anyway. So I'm using AL, right? So just, just the, lo the, the, the least significant portion of that register space. Then I'm gonna clear the rest of it, which I can just go ahead and do this move. And again, if this is, a, if this is wor wor uh, working on quad words, then I would wanna go ahead and, uh, uh, well, probably use a, uh, I could potentially use RAX as well. But then this would allow me to actually do that comparison because we're doing the compare here, which will then give me the result that I'm looking for. And then we could do our set to actually return whether it's gonna end up being true or false. 
Okay, so again, just like you're familiar with relational operators, there's multiple ways to kind of express the same thing. So you could say set G and you can say set NLE, which is set not plus or equal, right? And those would have the same result. Those would produce similar behavior. So yeah, understand there's multiple ways that you can do the same instruction. And that's just, that's just the case with any kind of relational set of operations. Okay, so let's take a look at our condition codes after our comparison. So suppose that I have A minus B, that we'll, we'll then go ahead and save into T. So suppose we have our condition code uh, set based off of this computation for our assigned comparison then, our signed flag, our overflow flag, and our zero flag are used. And for an unsigned comparison, it would just be the carry and the zero flags that are reported to us. So understand, based off of these computations, if we're trying to set our condition codes using comparisons, as opposed to setting them directly, make sure you understand which ones can be set based off of the data types you're using. And a big thing to recall is that typically signed and unsigned cases use the same kind of evaluation. It's just on these rare instances when only unsigned data, like again, with uh, certain types of shifts where we don't use the default value of our choose complement. Okay. so. The next section we're gonna talk about, and we're not gonna talk about today because we're already at 614. So we're not gonna jump into a new section, but we covered enough concepts now in assembly to finally get us to, I guess, a little bit of the more interesting portion, which again, I think a lot of you will already have a familiar, be familiar with, but it's gonna be how we can start doing our uh, control structures. And so our control structures are built off of being able to have jump instructions. So next class, we're going to go through the concept of jump instructions and then how we can use our jump instructions to create our um, selection operations, our, select, our selection structures like if statements or if else statements or like switch statements or how we can use our jump instructions to create repetition structures like for loops, do while loops and while loops. Then we'll move on to procedures. Uh, so let's see, I think we probably can get through the remaining portion of this. Let me go to the beginning. So we'll, we'll cover those concepts in 3.6 and we'll conclude with the control structures, so loops and uh, selections. Then we'll talk about procedures and array allocation and access and then heterogeneous data structures. And finally, we'll get to the point where we can then talk about combining control and data into our machine level programs, talk a little bit about floating point code. And then we'll be done, hopefully next lecture at the end of the next lecture with chapter three. Excellent. Does anyone have any questions before we go ahead and uh, um, break for the week? For the data lab, um, we're just using regular agents. Yeah. Oh yeah, so we'll yeah we'll talk more about uh, some some data lab. So I have a question: Is there going to be Zoom student hours tomorrow for data lab? Let's see, tomorrow's Friday. I could probably try to get online. I have um I have a hard deadline for a paper I have to submit for tomorrow, and then after I'll I'll do an announcement once I submit that. So anyone who needs some assistance. I'll go ahead and broadcast through the Discord. So make sure you're in Discord and I'll broadcast when I'm uh, available for providing some assistance. Excellent. Well, until then, I will see you all next Tuesday. Have a great weekend.